All right. Hello, everybody. Um, we are going to start our session in about two minutes uh, and let people in. Um, if you want, why don't you put in the uh, ch chat where you're from uh, so we know um, who we're talking to today. So we've got Charlotte County and Broward County, Lake County, Taylor County. We're just waiting a few more minutes if you just signed on. Um, we're letting people go, uh, into the session, uh, but we will start on time. Um, we have a great presentation today on Florida Friendly Mulch, and uh, we've got um, Dr. Chris Marble here to um, uh, give us a, a great presentation. Um, on selection and uses and some other, uh, you know, interesting and useful uh, mulch tips. So we've still got, we've got Palm Beach and Volusia County and Hillsborough County. Um, and uh, well, it looks like it's 11 o'clock. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start uh, to just keep us all on time. Um, hello and welcome to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program's homeowner webinar series, a series given every third, third, third Tuesday of the month at 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, my name is Jen Marvin and I'm the Florida Yards and Neighborhoods Statewide Coordinator for the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. Today we have Chris Marble speaking uh, about mulch. Um, our uh, your microphones have been muted. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Please stick around until the end and uh, take our exit survey. It should pop up uh, in your browser. Um, it helps me give you the kind of programming that you like and lets us know how we're doing. So it's a really important, uh, important survey for us so we can keep giving you um, the programs that you uh, want to see. Our next presentation will be March 21st um, at 11 a.m. on the new uh, soil kit tests that are soon to be rolling out at your extension offices. Um, so I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Chris Marble is an associate professor in ornamental and landscape invasive and weed management at, in the University of Florida's Environmental Horticulture Department and stationed at the Mid-Florida Research and Education Center. Dr. Marble's research and extension program focuses on developing effective and economical methods of weed control and mitigating negative environmental impacts from current weed management strategies uh, in ornamental plant production and landscapes. It is my pleasure to hand the floor over to Dr. Chris Marble. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and thank you yes. all for for uh, for tuning in uh, today. Uh, so yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit about mulch for the uh, the landscape. Uh, we'll talk about selecting mulch, some different uses, and then benefits. And um, uh, like Jennifer mentioned, I'm I'm mostly a weed control uh, specialist. I'm a weed scientist, um, but we'll and so that's what the the um, the presentation will mostly focus on. But I'll talk about a few other things too, just sharing some research from other University of Florida uh, scientists and, and other folks. So uh, we'll go ahead and we will get started. So um, just kind of an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, just some of the benefits of using mulch in the landscape, um, uh, mulching myths, 
Uh, I get several questions, I guess, because of all the research that I've done on mulch as a weed control tool, and really one of the most effective weed control tools there is for the landscape. Um, I'll get a lot of questions about mulch that don't necessarily pertain to weed control specifically, um, but uh, uh, there's some different myths and things out there about mulch, and people will have some misconceptions, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we'll also get into mulch types, so all the different mulch materials that are available, some of the advantages and disadvantages of each of those, um, the durability, how long they'll actually last in the landscape for the different types, um, and then how to select and then apply and use mulch in the landscape uh, and take care of it in terms of maintenance, you know, in terms of proper depth uh, and things like that. So we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, what is the definition of mulch? Um, this is a uh, this is what mulch was defined as by a paper by Linda Chalker Scott. Um, it was in Journal of Environmental Horticulture, if you're interested in actually reading a scientific journal article. But it's basically a review paper that came out about 15 years ago or so. Uh, and it's on all the environmental benefits of mulch in the landscape. And so the definition that they gave are materials that are applied to or grow upon the soil surface as opposed to materials that are incorporated into the soil profile. So that's the definition of mulch. So that really occupies, you know, a huge variety of things. Um, when we talk about mulch, you know, we're typically thinking of these loose fill kind of organic mulch materials or possibly something like rock like you might see in the landscape. Um, but mulch could also be, you know, like a living mulch uh, that you might see in agricultural production like you have uh, on this slide here. Uh, we're not going to really discuss a lot of those different things for uh, just for the sake of time. Uh, I just wanted to cover that there, there are different types of mulches that would be used, you know, not typically in the landscape type environment, but in other um, type of um, production systems and agriculture and things like that. But we'll mostly focus on um, when I'm when I'm talking about mulch, at least in this presentation, I'm talking about those organic loose fill mulches uh, that will be recommended, like the the bark materials and the wood materials, uh, straws, stuff like that. Um, so some of the benefits of mulch besides weed control, which we'll talk uh, about mostly in terms of my research that I've done on uh, the weed control benefits of mulch. But like I talked about, the best summary, at least that I could find, uh, is in that paper. Uh, it's an easy read and it's very, um, uh, so don't get intimidated that it's, you know, a scientific journal article. It reads like a, kind of like a magazine article, uh, very good article, Impact of Mulches on Landscape Plants and the Environment. And so it's a review paper where um, basically the author went in and looked at all the, the, uh, the research that had been done on different types of mulch and talked about the advantages and then disadvantages of different mulch types. But just some of the major uh, benefits that I see in terms of the landscape is that it'll significantly reduce irrigation and water needs. Um, when you're talking about those organic loose fill uh, type mulches, um, you're, you're cooling the soil and you're reducing the, um, the ability of that water to evaporate basically. And so those mulches are going to reduce the water needs and protect those plants in the landscape and really increase the survivability of those plants, uh, especially, you know, during the establishment uh, phase um, where, you know, we get into the springtime temperatures where it's really hot uh, and then we're also dry, but mulch can help keep that soil uh, moist, uh, really protect those plants. Um, you can have reduce, reduced soil erosion and compaction uh, with these uh, organic mulches also. Um, maintain soil temperature, and so that can you basically with these different mulch materials, if they're applied correctly, uh, you can um, basically prevent these major temperature fluctuations. So it's not going to get, um, you know, really hot or really cold. Uh, and mulch can be used. I mean, a lot of growers that I used to work with when I was in um, at Auburn and then we go up to Tennessee or and I lived in North Carolina for a while and they would use mulches and straws and things like that for winter protection uh, and production because it can um, keep those plant roots warm where you might get top damage, but you can keep that plant from dying in, you know, really cold temperatures by uh, applying mulch. Um, and then increase soil nutrition and organic matter. Um, I'll talk about the different benefits of all the, uh, the different mulch types, but that's the reason I'll typically recommend and, and FFL will recommend 
the organic um, loose fill type mulches like your barks and your woods and your straws and things like that because uh, it really increases soil nutrition uh, and organic matter of the soil and provides a lot of benefits there where you don't get that with some of those other uh, mulch types like specifically like uh, like rock or uh, of course like living mulches people aren't going to typically use those in a landscape type environment but those can actually compete uh, with uh, plants in some cases. Um, and then, of course, all these different things can combine uh, to improve plant establishment and growth. Um, I'm not going to have really time to go through all the different studies and research and things like that, but um, when mulch is applied properly, there's there's numerous papers, uh, 15 or 20 that I found, you know, just doing a quick uh, search uh, where these plants will uh, have better survivability and then the growth will increase um, when mulch is applied as opposed to a non-mulched um, plot. Um, so just some of the mulching myths and some of the questions that I've gotten uh, in the past about different mulches and some of the reasons why people might be hesitant to, uh, to use mulch or, or think that there could be a, a negative consequence to, um, uh, to you know, some of these mulch materials. Um, one thing is that people would say that it prevents water from reaching the, the soil and the plant root. So um, I guess the thinking behind this is, is if there's a, um, you know, mulch that's there that's applied and you're irrigating on top of it or something, uh, you know, that, that mulch is going to absorb some of that water and block it from reaching the, the plant roots. Um, but uh, like I said, uh, just in preparation for this and then in some of the other um, uh, uh, literature reviews and things I've done for my mulch work, um, a quick uh, Google Scholar search shows, um, you know, 50 studies in which organic mulches uh, increase soil moisture, increase soil moisture without impeding uh, soil water infiltration. So that's like your pine barks and things like that. Um, water can go through those pretty easily. Um, and then, you know, for the water that's already there in the soil from natural rainfall events and irrigation and things like that, you don't lose it as fast. And so you don't have to use as much water. So it can be used as a a water saving technique. Um, there was one study uh, that they were looking at um, basically growing trees like in a tree farm um, and the, the mulch trees required I think it was like 25 percent of the water that the non-mulch trees did. Um, and that's, that's one study but that was a replicated repeated uh, you know uh, randomized uh, research project. Um, the exceptions there are some exceptions to this so plastic mulches, obviously. So some people will use plastics and things like that and, and use those as a underlayment to uh, mulch. And those are the exceptions. So what those mulches do, if somebody was to use a plastic, like a, a non-permeable black plastic, um, they will initially you know, conserve moisture. But if water is not able to infiltrate those and it's not a permeable um, layer, you know, eventually it's going to dry that soil out under that plastic. Um, so that would be the exception to this, but like I talked about earlier um, in this presentation, we're going to mostly focus on those organic uh, mulches. Um, and then another exception would be like a living mulch, so like uh, if somebody used, a, 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 you know, like a, a grass or some of these cover crop type things as a mulch, but that's not typically going to be, you know, applicable for, for most landscape situations. Um, <clears throat> another thing, uh, people uh, think that they'll dramatically alter pH and uh, possibly cause negative consequences to plants. Um, this can be the case in certain scenarios where they'll see a you know a slight pH change in the soil. But typically, when you have when you're getting a a much more significant change in, in the soil pH, it's when mulches or different organic materials are incorporated heavily into the soil, not just applied onto the uh, the soil surface. Um, another thing that you'll see is that they'll contain allelochemicals or basically plant natural plant compounds uh, that could reduce plant growth. Um, and you typically don't see that for the most or the uh, of the mulches that people are commonly used. Uh, we did some work on this and then some other people have done some work. Um, you can definitely get some um, allelopathy uh, and some different um, extracts have been taken out that will reduce the germination or seedling growth. But 
you're not going to have any negative consequences for, you know, say mulching, a, you know, a established azalea or oak tree or something like that. Um, that's just, it's not going to happen in a landscape environment. And typically when you see those, that allelopathic effect, it's going to be from a fresh, very fresh mulch material. Um, and most of the stuff that you're going to be buying from a, a mulch supplier is going to be aged, uh, you know, to varying degrees. And so a lot of that um, has has um, has gone away. Um, so that's not like a big major mechanism of of, uh, of weed control in terms of the allele chemicals. It can have some effect in some cases, but um, don't really have to worry about, you know, established landscape plants with that. Um, another thing that you'll see is that increased pest pressure. Uh, and definitely the thing that people are mostly concerned about with this are, are termites. Um, uh, there's been some studies out of um, University of Florida and some other places. Uh, Faith Oy uh, has a good EDIS publication on this uh, in terms of the, uh, the uh, impacts of mulches on termite activity. I'm definitely not an entomologist or a pathologist, um, so I'm just relying on the expertise of, of other people. Um, but uh, subterranean uh, termite activity, um, it increased under a pea gravel uh, mulch more than it did under landscape mulches. Um, and then a diet of mulch, which these organic type mulches like barks, decreased survivability in one study. Um, and then um, typically a lot of the studies and things that they've seen are that mulch or that at least termites are more likely to be introduced into an area uh, if it's, you know, infested wood, like larger materials like railroad ties or firewood or something like that, uh, as opposed to a ground uh, mulch material, which termites often don't survive that processing. Um, now, mulches, because they increase soil moisture, uh, they can increase the ability of established termites to survive because they keep that soil moist, but they're not going to really uh, encourage uh, termite activity if they're not there. Um, but if it is applied in incorrectly uh, and it's applied way, you know, close to the house or at too high of a depth, um, it can provide a bridge over treated perimeters of homes. So if someone does like a termidor treatment around a, a home and you have that insecticide that's applied to provide a barrier, but then you go and you apply mulch right up to the base of the house, then the termites could use that as a bridge. Um, and that's explained in that EDIS article by, by Dr. Oy. Um, and she does a lot better, you know, um, a way of explaining that than I do. But um, um, so, um, you know, basically applying, you know, mulch properly is not going to be recommended to put it right to the house. You're typically just going to want an area, a non-mulched area around the home to uh, prevent those types of things. Um, very thin layer or mulch-free layer between, uh, you know, a, a within a foot of the home so that that soil can dry out uh, and it's not staying wet. Um, and then with disease issues, you know, like anything else, if a plant is staying too wet all the time, um, you know, you can get uh, a higher incidence of certain plant pathogens and things. So, you just don't want to apply that mulch too thick. And, and one thing specifically to look out for is if you had, um, you know, a landscape bed where you had deciduous trees. And so you're getting leaf litter on top of, you know, the mulch that's being applied and that can build up, you know, around the base of that plant and those, those stems and things aren't able to dry out. Um, that could be cleaned out um, so that those plants are able to, to uh, dry out, you know, in between irrigation cycles and rainfalls and things like that. Um, another thing that people will be concerned with is uh, things like arsenic and stuff like that, especially in the treated uh, wood materials. Um, and, and so that that's all goes back to uh, these, these kind of these color mulches that are these scrap wood materials uh, that are typically dyed. Um, the dye isn't going to really cause an issue, uh, but it, the wood could be um, uh, uh, treated with chrom um, chromated copper uh, arsenic, uh, which is a wood preservative wood preservative uh, that they'll use in treated wood materials. Uh, and so that could be, you know, a potential concern in some cases, but kind of a way around that is if you're using these, especially these colored mulch materials, uh, where they're using that recycled wood, you could look and see if it's certified by uh, the MC, MSC, which is the Mulch and Soil Council. Um, you can look at their website, you can just Google Mulch and Soil Council, uh, and read about them. Uh, they're basically, it's a voluntary certification process so that a mulch uh, supplier could go and get it certified where you know the source of the uh, the mulch that's actually going into it and you know that it didn't contain 
um, that, that treated uh, lumber uh, with that material. So that's one way to certify is look for this logo, uh, you know, on the bag. Um, so just going into some of the different mulch materials that someone has to choose from, there's a lot of different stuff out there. Um, really, you, it comes down to barks, uh, like pine straw, and then, you know, different types of, of shredded wood materials, I assume. And so all of these have different advantages and disadvantages, and we'll just go through uh, a couple of these. So pine bark, uh, you know, that's real common. You'll see pine bark in different particle sizes, a large pine bark particle versus small. Um, barks are going to typically last longer than, than wood type materials. Um, and so barks, you know, advantages it's durable. It's going to stay around for a while. I'll show you some studies that have been done in terms of how long the different most materials last. Um, and uh, so it's a good uh, good material, provides organic matter to the soil, et cetera. Um, a disadvantage would be is if someone used a bark that was, um, it's all about processing, which we'll talk about, uh, you know, later. And so you wouldn't want like a, a bark material that's really fine, um, that could be almost like a potting um, soil, a potting substrate, because uh, those aren't going to provide the same weed control benefits. They'd be fine for, uh, you know, the health of the plants, but um, they're not going to provide weed control as good. And then the very large material. So you can get some pine bark where you have, you know, chunks of wood and bark that are, you know, five inches, um, you know, across or so. And so there's nothing inherently wrong about those, but to get um, good surface coverage where you're covering the whole surface of the soil, you typically have to go at a higher depth and just purchase more mulch with those larger particle materials because there's a lot of gaps and crevices and things in those. And I'll show you a picture of, of kind of how that looks here in a few slides. Um, pine straw, um, it's very affordable. You often get more coverage for the cost. Um, it's also easy to apply um, where you get it into the bales. Uh, and you can go out and just shake those uh, out. Um, so um, easy to apply, um, um, uh, pretty affordable. Uh, the disadvantage is that the straws of all the different real common mulch materials is typically going to degrade the fastest. Um, and then also depending upon where you're at, um, it might not be as readily available. Um, so you can definitely get, you know, you know, straw in Central and South Florida at different places but it might not be as readily available where you could just stop at the store and get, um, you know, a couple of bales of pine straw. It's just not as common um, in certain parts of the state than it would be like in Alabama or Georgia or something like that, where, uh, you know, all the big box places usually have a trailer full of, of pine straw out there for people to buy. Um, you also might see Melaleuca. Um, so uh, that is a, a, a bark, I mean, it's, it's a wood mulch. Um, that's from melaleuca trees, which are highly invasive. Um, so advantage of that is you're you're uh, contributing to killing melaleuca trees. So that's a uh, that's a uh, advantage um, because they are an invasive um, uh, species. Um, also compared to some of the other wood materials, the melaleuca mulches um, they could be cheaper in some cases too. Um, the disadvantage with that is it's going to last you know longer than um, like straws, for example, but maybe not as long as like pine bark. Uh, at least when we've done the trials. But then also uh, with some of these wood materials, if they're processed where you have really small particles, they can hold a lot of moisture uh, in the mulch layer, uh, which isn't necessarily bad, you know, from a plant's perspective, but for weed control, you can get germination, you know, on top of that mulch layer. Uh, and I'll show you uh, some research that shows that. Um, grass clippings, leaves, uh, you know, basically, um, you know, any kind of organic matter that you're getting from doing regular landscape maintenance, uh, that's going to be essentially free, um, good for the plants. Um, you know, uh, you're putting it uh, to where it can be um, for good use. Um, the disadvantage of those is that they're not going to be, um, you know, they're not going to provide really a weed control benefit in most cases. Um, and if it's like grass clippings, for example, um, one thing to look out for is that, you know, if you have weeds in the uh, the lawn, and you're going out and you're bagging that material and using it as mulch, you're going to get you put that mulch, uh, that, that those long clippings. Um, typically, you don't have too much of an issue with herbicide residues. Um, if someone's not, you know, regularly treating their lawn with, with herbicides, that's not really a concern. Um, but certain herbicides can cause issues 
when the, that grass has been treated and then it's uh, collected pretty soon afterwards and used as mulch around um, plants. I definitely wouldn't recommend using those, uh, those long clippings and things like that around something that you're going to eat like in a garden. Uh, but for landscape plants, that's, that's not typically an issue. There has been some issues with herbicides in the past uh, where people ran into major issues with this. Um, but a lot of those herbicides are no longer labeled for use, uh, at least in residential lawns. Um, the next one, utility mulch. So this could be, uh, you know, a variety of different things. Basically, uh, when a, a city or, you know, a government contract is going through and cleaning up trees for power lines or, um, you know, after storm cleanup and stuff like that, uh, they're grinding all that material together uh, and then they'll sell that or give it away as mulch. Um, and so it's usually very low cost or it might be free. Uh, you know, if you've got a truck, you can go and get, you know, as much as you want. Um, it's usually composed of wooden bark, um, be an option for like a natural area and things like that. Um, but it could contain weed seed, um, possibly invasive seeds um, or, or dirt. Uh, so, you know, it might not be something that you want to use around your, um, your, your uh, areas where you want to be, you know, very aesthetically pleasing, like the front of a home or around a, a annual color bed or something because a lot of times those materials are pretty large in terms of how they're putting it through the chipper uh, and it might contain um, uh, you know a lot of dirt and things you go to a um, you know a mulch yard um, and it's free and they're just going to probably put it in the back of a truck with a backhoe or something and so they're you know probably scooping up a lot of dirt and things and so um, that could cause an issue that's mostly aesthetic and things like that. Um, a couple that, that wouldn't typically uh, be uh, recommended, um, the first would be rock. Um, that's obviously the most durable. It's not going to wash away. Um, so different rocks and, and um, uh, things like that that could be useful for, you know, smaller areas of the landscape, maybe under a downspout or something like that. Um, but uh, in terms of using it for a mulch, you know, in a larger area, it's not going to provide those same benefits that we talked about before on those first slides. And it's definitely going to be the by far the most expensive uh, that you can do. Um, you're also typically going to have to apply uh, landscape fabric um, uh, on where you put the rock down. Uh, and if you do that in an existing landscape, it is a it is a big pain. And so uh, not really as a scientist, but as somebody who did landscaping for about eight years, I don't like landscape fabric or rock because it is a it's a hard job. Um, but you know, eventually with those with those fabrics, um, you're going to get weeds that either germinate on top of those or, or come up through them, uh, and so it can be harder to clean up with those fabrics. You know, over time they'll initially give you a good weed free start, but over time they're going to start to fail and break down. And even if they don't break down, you'll get plenty of weeds uh, that are growing through those um, rubber mulches. You know, those could be. Uh, you know, options for maybe around playgrounds or something like that, or a walking path. Um, there's a couple of, of concerns associated with rubber mulches, um, uh, zinc levels in some cases, um, uh, zinc toxicity to plants. Um, they're also, in terms of all the studies where they've looked at flammability of different mulch materials, it's typically the most highly flammable, so easiest to catch on fire. Um, you also don't get those same benefits in terms of the organic matter and things. Um, and then cypress mulch, you know, it's basically the advantages to it would be similar to like the wood materials because it's just a shredded uh, wood bark, but the source is hard to determine. So that's the reason UF doesn't recommend cypress is because you don't want to be going into natural areas and just harvesting trees just for uh, the purposes of mulch. All the other mulch materials that we talked about are byproducts of some other um, uh, industry typically. Um, so here's a study that I'll just talk about in terms of uh, longevity. Um, this is a paper that came out, you know, a long time ago, over 20 years ago, uh, by um, uh, Duria et al. 1999. Uh, but they looked at several different mulch materials, uh, and then they tracked the de decomposition, or basically how fast they broke down over the span of a year, uh, or two years in one case, but I'll show you the results from, from one year. Um, so this is the durability of landscape mulch. So they all started out at nine centimeters uh, at initially. So that's three and a half inches, uh, just about. Uh, and so they tracked that. And so what you'll see is initially after three months, you had a big decrease in everything. And that's just basically natural settling. 
So no matter what depth you start at at mulch, you're going to get some naturally set, natural settling as those mulch materials kind of work themselves uh, and start to uh, to settle down. Um, but you see the most settling with the pine straw, which is represented by this um, by this green bar right here. Um, but then you look over time, uh, and then you can see we'll look at the uh, the 12 months in particular, uh, pine bark and melaleuca. I don't think there was a statistical difference um, between between those two, but those were uh, typically lasted the longest. And then you had the different wood materials, and then pine straw is the shortest. And so that's kind of what we talked about. Um, typically, it goes bark, your wood materials, uh, and then your straws and things like that in terms of longevity. Um, and then utility mulches and stuff, that can be very hard to replicate because you go and get a batch of utility mulch and then um, do a study with it one time and then you get it again. And it might be comprised of a bunch of different species or possibly um, processed differently. Um, uh, but in this particular study, uh, uh, you know, it was about similar to those others or it decayed, you know, less than pine bark, for example. So they all last, you know, a, a pretty good bit of time. Um, but the straws are going to break down faster. Um, so um, selecting the different mulch materials. Um, so of course, you know, aesthetics, you know, part of the overall landscape design, um, you know, in terms of what it looks like and how it's going to fit in uh, with everything in the landscape. And I'm not a design person. Uh, so someone like um, uh, Gail Hansen, who has a lot of good uh, EDIS articles on, on things like landscape design and stuff, um, that's a that's a thing, just personal preference and stuff like that. Um, but in terms of weed control and then a lot of these benefits where you get kind of the most bang for your buck, you want materials that are fairly, not not too large, but you want them to be very large materials and you want the most material to, to drain quickly um, uh, for weed control. You don't want the mulch layer to hold a bunch of water. You just want the mulch to keep the water uh, in the soil where uh, you need it for the plants. Um, also, uh, before you go and you buy a bunch of mulch, consider the availability of some of these different materials. Uh, mulch is very regional in terms of where it is available. Um, so like I said, like if you go and you, you know, you landscape a, a large yard with one mulch type, um, it's something like pine bark or uh, one of these shredded wood materials, you probably will be able to get it and replace it. But if you did, um, you know, maybe pine straw, maybe that was low in availability, uh, one year, maybe you used a certain type of color of, of, of colored dye wood or something, and you couldn't get it to, to replenish it over time. So that's something to think about, too. Um, you want it to be sustainable. And I already talked about the concerns with some of the cypress mulches. Um, and then, of course, cost and then coverage. So um, how much coverage am I going to get um, uh, per uh, bag of all these different things? Uh, and I'll show you a slide on, on really what coverage, uh, what I'm talking about by coverage, because the larger particle material, typically the more that you'll have to do to get that adequate 100% um, coverage. Um, in terms of particle size and weed germination, um, this was a study that we looked at where we're, uh, uh, this was more in line with the nursery production research that I've done. Um, but you can see, this is uh, artillery weed, and this is the impact of particle size on, on germination. Um, or I'm going to talk about artillery weed, but we did it with um, four different weed species. But just look at some of these finer, um, these smaller seeds like artillery weed, where if we had a large particle mulch that was like, um, uh, you know, a, a pine bark nugget, that was essentially what this was, was similar to. We're getting 6 to 22 percent uh, germination percentage of those seeds. And then if we go up to these fine materials, like finer than extra fine, and then we're at basically maximum germination, 85 to 90 percent germination with those. Um, but you can see with this large particle material, we had the lowest germination of, of all those weed species um, in, in this study with artillery weed, spurge, crabgrass, um, and eclipta. So the particle size definitely does have an effect on weed germination because as those particle sizes increase, it holds less moisture in the weed germination. Uh, can decrease it, at least when you're talking about seeds that are introduced on top of the, the mulch. Um, and this is what I mean by, by size and quantity and things like that, just something to consider. So um, for this, this photo, this is nursery pots, um, but it gives a good representation uh, of what I'm talking about. So 
This is no mulch right here. So this is just a, a potting soil uh, that's comprised of pine bark, peat, and sand. And that will be a typical you know, nursery grower mix. Um, these two mulches, this is a, a pine bark nugget. This is a large nugget, which might be anywhere from one inch to five inch you know, pieces of pine bark. Uh, and then this is a smaller mini nugget um, right here. So this is like um, somewhere between half of an inch to two inch you know, particle size, so much smaller. The same volume of, of bark was applied to both of these pots and they're all filled at the same depth. When you have the larger particle materials, you have a lot more, um, it's not as dense essentially, and you have a lot more gaps. So same volume of mulch was applied to both of these pots, but with this smaller particle material, you're getting 100% coverage. And with this larger particle material, they have all these gaps, which are represented by these, um, by these arrows here where there's surface of the soil that's, that's showing essentially. Um, and I mean, you could arrange that to where you don't get it in a landscape situation. You're not going to have those same gaps. Uh, but with those larger particle materials, you do typically have to go slightly higher um, to get that, you know, 100% coverage. Um, now, advantage of that large particle material is it's going to last longer. Um, so, you know, over time, you might uh, be better off with those. Uh, but at least initially to get that 100% coverage that you need for weed control, um, you can typically get you know, greater coverage uh, in terms of covering up the soil surface at a lower depth with something like a, a, a mini uh, nugget or finer particle material. Um, so proper depth and amount, um, you want to go two to three inches. Um, uh, you can go, uh, you know, a little bit higher than that in some cases, but that's general recommendation. And that's once it's settled down uh, and things. And so with the different mulch materials, it kind of depends upon your initial depth and what it'll actually settle down to. Um, in terms of how much you need, there's a lot of different mulch calculators available. There's a good EDIS article uh, out there um, that I helped with a little bit that, that talks about how to calculate that for your, determining your square footage. Um, just a, a tip or whatever, when you're looking, typically your two options are buying it in bulk or in a bag. Um, so 27 cubic feet in the cubic yard. Um, and then, you know, you can typically get two foot bags or three foot bags um, and, and look at that too. Don't just look at a bag because you might see, you know, one place that has a bag that might be cheaper, but it's two cubic feet as opposed to another place that has a bag that might be slightly more expensive at the same price. That's a three foot cubic bag. And so that makes a big difference. Um, you know, you're talking about a yard of mulch uh, it's require, it will require 13 two-foot bags or nine three-foot bags. So, yeah, aunties, it might not make that big of a difference in cost, but if you're talking about buying, you know, multiple yards of mulch to do a, a large landscape, um, you know, that adds up over time, and especially when you're talking about going back and replenishing that uh, and everything. So um, uh, those are things to consider. Uh, and then whether you want to do it as, uh, you know, a bolt material and have it delivered or, or get it in a truck or something versus a bag, typically it's going to be more expensive per yard by buying it by the bag. But that's also a lot of cases easier to apply. You don't have to use a, a wheelbarrow, uh, you know, except for to maybe move the, the mulch material uh, around, but you don't have to shovel it, um, you know, all day and everything. Um, and then when you're applying the mulch, uh, you know, basically the, the main thing, um, weed prior to applying the mulch, um, you can suffocate some weeds that I'll talk about on the next slide, uh, but you want it to be weed free. You want to start, uh, you know, as clean as possible um, because no matter what you do, you know, you're going to get weeds that come in there regardless. They're just kind of tenacious like that. Um, this was a study that we did where we looked at this and we were looking at rice hull mulch. Um, which is probably the most common mulch that they'll use in nursery production. So it doesn't really have much applicability to a landscape, but we've seen the same thing with uh, uh, pine bark mulch, which we did uh, in this trial too. I just don't have that data up here, but this is the shoot dry weight of bittercress and oxalis uh, at two different stages of growth. Uh, but basically the bittercress uh, uh, shoot weight or the growth of it is represented by these green bars and then oxalis is by these black uh, bars here. And so the thing to kind of notice, so what we did with these is we, we germinated the seeds, we let them get up to a certain size, the largest size, what we call two to four leaf size. And that's about what you see on this picture here. Uh, these are a little bit larger, um, but we applied the, the rice holes 
at these different depths. And the idea behind this was is to see if a nursery grower um, has, you know, some small seedlings in a pot, can they go and put the rice holes on top of that and all those weeds going to be able to emerge through. Now, these small weeds that are, you know, you can see a, a penny here uh, and then the size of the bitter crest there, uh, they weren't able to get up through a, a one inch or we basically, we kind of smothered those out. So for those small seedling type weeds, um, if you apply, you know, a two to three inch layer of mulch, you might be able to suffocate some of those out for some of those small uh, annual weeds. Um, but for some of the larger stuff like nut sage, for example, um, I tell people, you know, they'll say, you know, um, what's the best mulch for weed control? And it's always, you know, it depends. And then we talk about different things. What's the number one weed that you've got? I'm trying to get rid of nut sedge. And I say, well, the best uh, mulch for that is, is asphalt, uh, four to five inches of asphalt. And that will slow it down for, um, you know, a few weeks. And then the nut sedge will come up uh, through that. So uh, being facetious there. Uh, but uh, the uh, you know, it's going to, those some weeds will come up through the mulch regardless of depth, but for some of these smaller ones, you can control it by kind of smothering it out. But overall, the recommendation is to get it weed free. So optimizing mulch for uh, mulch use for, for weed control. Um, and we'll just talk about some different things here. So um, the ways that mulches are actually controlling weeds, they'll either provide a physical barrier like we just talked about, they'll reduce light or they'll reduce available water. Um, and then allelopathy with some mulch materials, but that's generally not effective for most of the mulches that we actually uh, deal with. Um, but that's kind of how they're how the mulches are controlling uh, the weeds. Um, so this is a study that we did where we just looked to see um, light through the different mulches at the different layers. So this was the pot. We had this clear tube. We stuck a light meter uh, in here to measure the light levels under the different depths of mulch to see if there was a difference. Uh, between the different depths, uh, and we track that over time. Um, and so this was basically what we saw. If you got, you know, 100% coverage of that soil surface, uh, and you've got a one-inch layer, um, really there wasn't any difference between one and, and four inches. You're not really blocking out more light. Uh, the four-inch, you know, or the two-inch will definitely provide more of a physical barrier, but you're not excluding uh, more light. You know, you're blocking out almost 100% of the light uh, at that one-inch layer. Uh, when you have just a half of an inch, that's when you get a lot of light coming through. Uh, and so you're not going to get that same benefit um, as you will with those higher depths. You know, two is a good, two to three is a good balance between blocking out a lot of light, providing a physical barrier, but then not applying uh, too much to where you see negative uh, effects from the plants. Like um, you might see with like volcano mulching or something like that. Um, we also looked at particle size and kind of water how much water stayed in a mulch layer over time. Uh, and that's what these, these studies were. So these are soil sieves. And we looked to see, you know, how many particles of these different mulches stayed in each of these layers to kind of determine, uh, you know, if we get pine bark, how much are really small material particles, how much are really large particles. And we did the same thing with straw uh, and then a wood uh, mulch. Uh, and then we looked at water. We just simulated a a one inch irrigation or rainfall event, and then look to see how long it takes for those mulches to dry um, over the span of 24 hours. Um, and so this is what we saw with particle size analysis. With the, um, what we want is particle sizes that are larger. So basically up here on the top part of the slide, as we get down lower, uh, you know, they just don't provide the same weed control benefit. So with the hardwood material, which you see right here, you have a lot of real fine materials where that wood was, was shredded and broke down. Uh, and so we had a lot more smaller materials. Uh, and then with pine bark mini nuggets, we had, uh, you know, a larger percentage was comprised of those larger materials and the same with pine straw where over half were, were large materials. And so these two are going to dry out uh, much faster. Uh, they're all going to provide, you know, a benefit in terms of keeping the soil um, uh, moist, but in terms of the mulch layer itself, you want it to dry out for weed control. Um, and then here's what they look like, you know, over a span of 24 hours. So a eucalyptus and a melaleuca mulch that were uh, finely, um, or they were shredded. You can see them uh, right here. So a lot of small materials. Um, and so they were, uh, the, uh, they were retaining a lot more moisture about this, this represented by these two bars right here. Uh, and then you have pine bark and pine straw right down here, the gray and the yellow bar. Uh, and so we're at, you know, 10 or 15 percent 
of the uh, the moisture that was applied is still there in that bark layer after 24 hours, and then almost you know around 30 percent of those shredded wood material. So they're holding water uh, much longer um, uh, than those others. That doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad thing, but for weed control, you can get um, higher germination with that. Um, and that's what we saw here. So um, this is pine bark, pine straw, hardwood, and then a non-mulch control. Uh, and so when seeds are below the mulch, uh, where it doesn't really matter how much water is being held in that mulch, the mulch is just acting as a physical barrier and blocking out light. Uh, we had excellent control with all those different particles. Uh, I mean, with all those different mulch materials, pine bark, pine straw, and hardwood, essentially no or very little germination. Uh, but then if we put the seeds on top of the mulch, this hardwood, which is represented by the green, we had the same germination and weed growth as we did in the non-mulch control because that wood material held a lot of moisture in that mulch layer. And so as seeds were introduced on top, uh, those seeds were able to germinate and, and they, they grew if it wasn't um, you know, at like a one or two inch depth. So uh, that's what I mean by you want the mulch to be a fairly larger particle and, and to dry out faster. Um, and then this is an interesting study, and that's what I say people shouldn't be as concerned with the mulch type, but look at the physical properties of the mulches, um, because we had a lot of differences with all these different mulch materials in terms of the shoot weight of uh, these three different weed species that we looked at. Um, uh, but then if we equalized the, the mulch material and we used all these different ones, eucalyptus, mixed wood chips, cypress, melaleuca, pine bark, and they were all processed in this, a similar way where our particle sizes were pretty same, pretty much similar. Um, they all provided, you know, a similar benefit. So a lot of times it's how that, that mulch is actually what's comprised of it in terms of the particle size as opposed to the actual type. Of. Um, and then combining herbicides and mulch, um, uh, I'm going to uh, go through this fairly quickly um, um, just because we're running short on time. But um, the idea behind this, this photo was is that we basically, this pot right here where we have the plus signs, um, those received a herbicide. So those were, those were the, all these pots were mulched. Uh, and then when they were mulched, we went and we treated the plus uh, bar. So right here on pine bark, right here on pine straw, right here on hardwood, and then no mulch. So there was, um, on these three, they were mulched at the start. We went through and we applied herbicide, and then we, after they were, after the herbicide was applied, we pulled the mulch off uh, and then seeded all the uh, the pots to essentially see it, how much of that herbicide is binding to the mulch material and not reaching the soil. Uh, and so you can see with pine bark and then with hardwood specifically, um, we had, um, you know, we had some benefit. Uh, some of that herbicide got through uh, the mulch layer. Uh, compared to the uh, the non mulch, so this didn't have any, this didn't have any mulch or any herbicide on it. So we definitely had a, a weed control benefit from the herbicide, um, but definitely not like no mulch. When no mulch was there at the time of herbicide application, we had 100% control. And the same thing with pine bark or with pine straw, rather. So <clears throat> some of these mulch materials are some of the herbicides are binding to that mulch when you apply them. Um, uh, but it can still provide a weed control benefit. Um, they're binding to the mulch, but then, um, you know, you're going to get these that land on top of that mulch, and that herbicide that's there can still provide a benefit in some cases. And that's what you see here. Um, so uh, one inch with a herbicide, uh, two inches with a herbicide, and then two inches no herbicide. So um, herbicide was applied on top, and the seeds were applied on top. And so you still had a, a weed control benefit when the herbicide was used on the mulch in this particular study with these large pine bark particles. Um, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use herbicides um, uh, when you're talking about herb, uh, weed control in planting beds. Um, these pre-emergence herbicides a lot of times aren't needed if that mulch layer is kept at a proper depth. Um, that's what's represented by this, this slide here. So uh, we did this study over the span of a year and we looked at total costs. Um, so um, just using um, straw mulch, just using pine bark mulch, just using a herbicide with no mulch or combining them, straw plus herbicide and bark plus herbicide. We didn't see a, you know, a huge difference between just using the mulch uh, and then combining the herbicide with those. 
Um, the two most expensive treatments are basically the two most expensive treatments in terms of weed control wars. The, the uh, regular herbicide applications, which was the second least expensive versus nothing. So we just went in and hand weeded those. But I say it all the time and in every trial that I've ever done when I'm looking at mulch at least, you know, two inches or so, one application of mulch is going to outperform one application of a pre-emergence herbicide on just about any weed species, at least when you're talking about weed species that are germinating from seed. Um, so that would exclude some things, uh, but um, that's going to be, um, uh, really, we see that one um, uh, application of mulch will always outcompete one application of pre-emergence herbicides, or in almost a lot of cases, all the cases that I've done. Um, We've looked at mulches, you know, in, in container nurseries and things like that. We've looked at a lot of different materials uh, in different environments, um, pine bark, sawdust. Uh, this is a plastic mulch uh, that we looked at. Uh, there's irrigation risers that are underneath this mulch layer, uh, and then herbicide, um, and then, you know, no mulch. This was actually a, a, a paper slurry that was applied that forms kind of a hard crust uh, on the pots, and that was an interesting thing to look at. Um, but the, uh, the thing that I want to show you is with all these different mulch materials, like you look at pine bark and hardwood, which would be something similar to like what you would see in the landscape, they outperform the herbicide, the regular herbicide applications as well. And so you see that, you know, in a lot of cases when mulch is used correctly, it'll do better than, um, you know, a single or even a few different pre-emergence applications if it's kept at the right depth. Um, so uh, keeping that depth um, uh, adequate, just check that depth periodically. Um, when you see bare spots or you see that soil poking through, you know, that might be time to reapply the mulch to that particular area. Um, you're going to get some weed growth regardless of the depth. Um, you know, you could apply six inches of, of pine bark and you'll get uh, nut sedge or something like torpedo grass that can come through that. Um, so, you know, going higher doesn't necessarily always mean better weed control for some of these weed species. Um, some mulches can start to form a mat if they're there for a long period of time and they have different wetting and drying cycles. So it could be right to prevent becoming hydrophobic um, if it formed a mat and water really wasn't getting to it after it, if it formed that mat. Um, but um, and then the mulch that's already there usually doesn't need to be removed um, unless it started to build up to levels and got real close to the uh, the base of the plants. And in that case, it might be raked out. But in most cases, you just go and and freshen it up, you know, and keep it at that, that two to three inch uh, depth. Um, and so summary, it's just going to provide a lot of benefits. Really, you can't go, go wrong with it. Uh, some of these organic loose fill type mulches, uh, important part of design. Uh, my wife, who doesn't know anything at all about plants, uh, and then she was uh, talking about, I redid a landscape bed, and she's like, it looks so much, it's a huge difference between when it's mulch versus when it's uh, bare soil. And I was like, yeah, I know. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, even people that, that don't really appreciate uh, ornamental plants or, or landscapes and things like that, they can they notice, uh, you know, when an area has mulch, it just ties the design together. Um, it's going to protect the plants, and then also it's the best weed control tool that we have, uh, you know, in and around ornamental plants in the landscape. Um, cornerstone of a good weed control program, um, really effective non-chemical method of weed control. Um, it's going to almost always outperform a single pre-emergence application uh, and it'll last a lot longer than Rebecca, is your um, uh, screen frozen? Is Chris's screen frozen? Chris's screen is frozen. Okay. We're still recording, Jen, so you could jump in if you'd like. Um, oops, I think we just lost him. Um, why don't we wait for just a moment uh, and see if he is able to sign back on? It's okay. Kind of unusual. It's kind of unusual considering that he's on a university landline um, for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. Either way, we apologize for this. Yes. We do have several questions here uh, that I am not able to answer. So um, we will wait until Chris signs back on. We'll wait a few minutes and um, we, we may have to end the, uh, the webinar early. Um, I we've we've had some discussion about cypress trees um, being sustainable. Um, it's my understanding and the understanding of um, the uh, IFAS researchers that we use to um, vet our information um, that. Uh, cypress uh, that it uh, cypress mulch is its origin is not always um, of, of a it's not always of a sustainable origin. So we err on the side of caution and um, uh, say that um, we recommend that you do not use cypress mulch. Um, uh, based on what our experts have told us. Um, I, I, I do understand that, um, oh, I'm sorry, I turned my camera back on. Uh, I do understand that some people disagree, um, but we are going by what uh, our uh, peer review journals and our um, experts in the field have have told us and have recommended to us. So um, if you see in the chat, there's a discussion about it. Um, that's that's my understanding of how uh, um, Florida Friendly has gotten their recommendations, um, and and we stand by them. Um, I will do some more. Um, information. I will do some more reading about uh, the um, SFI certification, um, but I uh, Florida Friendly still stands by um, what we uh, have recommended. So um, uh, that's the. Uh, recommendation of Florida Friendly. Um, mulch, I, I wanted to say uh, in regard to rock mulch and rubber mulch and those inorganic mulches, um, Florida Friendly does not recommend those mulches in plant beds. Uh, they are, uh, as Chris said, are um, not contributing anything to the soil as they break down. Uh, Rock mulch can, under Florida Friendly, we we uh, don't recommend rock mulch except for around houses or in pathways, um, just to make that clear. Um, let's see. Uh, well, I'm sorry that he is not back on. Um, Rebecca, should we end early? Okay, um, I think we're going to end early. Um, I really am, uh, I apologize for the um, the technical difficulties we're having here. Uh, maybe we'll try to get uh, Dr. Marble back on uh, to um, give this talk again. I, I believe he was probably almost finished with the talk, uh, but um, if you have questions about mulch, um, feel free to send them to me and I, I can pass them on to Dr. Marble. Um, my email is jw 
M-A-R-V-I-N at ufl.edu, uh, J.W. Marvin at ufl.edu. Uh, send your questions to me and I will um, try to pass them on to, um, to uh, Dr. Marble. Um, I, again, I apologize for the technical difficulties uh, and um, please tune into our next um, our next webinar, homeowner webinar uh, next month. Um, we will be talking to Dr. Brian Unruh about some uh, new soil testing kits that are coming out on the market um, that are um, remarkable uh, and give you a lot of information. Um, and I think it'll be a really interesting uh, webinar for uh, you all to see, um, it, you know, what's new and what's upcoming in um, in our, uh, you know, in our in our field as far as soil testing goes. Um, so I will uh, sign off. I, again, I apologize. Um, I will see what I can do about getting Dr. Marble back. Um, you know, for a to to finish his um, uh, webinar. Um, so thank you, thank you all for attending. I hope to see you next month. Uh, if you'd like to sign up for or pre-register for our um, webinar, uh, you can go to our webpage, uh, floridafriendlylandscaping.com. It, I believe it's under resources and webinars and go to the homeowner webinar uh, page, click on the webinar that you'd like to see and a registration page will come up uh, and then you will get a link uh, as it gets closer to the um, webinar uh, time. So thanks again and we will see you hopefully next month. <laughs>